can that energy Q be transferred? What are the, what are the processes or the mechanisms by which energy, thermal energy, heat energy can be transferred from one place to another? So that's what we discuss over here. There are three um, mechanisms that we discuss. One of them is conduction. Another one is, you know, you can, thermal energy may be conducted right through a material. Another one is convection. It's another mechanism by which thermal energy may be transferred from hot to cold. And the third one, which is really where I'm gonna spend most of my time, is on energy transfer by radiation. Electromagnetic waves. Okay. So for conduction, um, the amount of energy transferred right uh, through a material, and you know, for conduction process, is how energy is transferred right through a solid material. So. Um, for example, we have this unit here, which is metal. If I start a fire over here at the end of this, start a fire here, uh, so that, you know, there's a fire here, so it makes, I make this hot without melting it, right? And then maybe I put ice over here at the other end. So I keep this cold, I keep the other end hot, so thermal energy is going to be conducted right through the solid material from hot to cold. And if I consider, let's say, it's, this is like a rod, like a solid, right? So what if I keep this hot? So the temperature there is T sub H for hot. And I keep this here cold. So the temperature there is T sub C for cold. And the separation between the hot end and the cold end is L, then if I consider the thermal energy being conducted from hot to cold, so this is heat energy Q, if I consider the energy that is being conducted through a cross-sectional area, okay, perpendicular to it, Then this is the amount of thermal energy that's going to be conducted in every second that goes by. That's going to be conducted right through that cross-section area. So it's really a, and it, that's an expression for the power. So the power conducted power is energy over time. So it'll be the energy conducted. through the cross-section area in one second per unit time. So this power, it's labeled here, the author, the new, the, the authors of the text, but they call it capital H, I, I tend to call it P, but you know, they call it H. Um, this is really an energy over time, per unit of time. So for example, suppose you work this out and you get that this power for a particular problem with given numbers, suppose the power conducted is 10 watts. What does that mean? So 10 joules, what? So, right, so what that means is that if, if I measure a time interval of one second, the amount of energy that's gonna go through that is 10 joules. And by the way, it's the same to that process area, to this cross-sectional area, if these temperatures are maintained, it'll be the same. So every cross-sectional area, right, if the power being transferred from hot to cold is 10 watts, it means that through a cross-sectional area, you have 
10 joules of energy coming through in one second. In the next second, another 10 joules of energy. In the next second, another 10 joules of energy. In the next second, another 10 joules of energy. Then 10 joules of thermal energy will go through the cross-section area. Um, and you can see the formula <laughs> there. What is this power transported equal to P or H uh, or Q over delta T? What does it depend on? Well, it depends on the temperature difference. The bigger the temperature difference between this end and this end, the more energy is going to go through this cross-sectional area in one second. So it depends on that difference. So T hot minus T cold. Um, what else? It also depends on how close those two ends of this bar are. The closer they are together for the same temperature difference, you're going to get more energy through per second. So that L goes in the denominator. By the way, this L that we see in this formula is not this L, right? This is the latent heat of fusion or the latent heat of vaporization. This L over here is the distance, is the separation distance from this end, which is maintained at this temperature TH, and this other end, which is maintained at the temperature T sub C. Uh, it's also proportional to the area that the energy is going to go through. The more area, well, the more energy is going to go through. And then there is a parameter, K, right, uh, which is known as the, you know, uh, coefficient of uh, conduction, thermal conduction, or the thermal conductivity. So K, I didn't list any values there, but this is the thermal conductivity of the material. It, it's a number that depends on whether this rod is made of iron or whether it's made out of aluminum or copper or you know depends on the material how easily the material can transport the energy from hot to cold um, and I guess I have another picture here you know like this so in this picture here is the rod separated by a distance L right so this end over here is is of the rod is in contact with this thing which is hot at a temperature TH. This other end over here is in contact with, a, with the um, something that's cold. L is a separation distance between this hot end and the cold end. And you see the cross section area. Pretty much that's what I drew over here. So this is in joules per second. Right, so that's the formula. In lab, one of these days, for one of these occasions, I will derive that formula. In the textbook, it's only given to you. But I think that we'll have enough so that we can derive it. You know, why is it that? Where, where does that come from? So I'll, I'll derive that. It's one of the extra examples for chapter 17 where we derive that. Okay, it is important for you to realize that uh, this is thermal energy that is being conducted from the hot end to the cold end. Uh, and if you can imagine the atoms over here vibrating and then, you know, if they're vibrating vigorously, they'll, you know, shake the atoms that are next to them. And those are gonna shake the atoms, you know, that are next to them. And, you know, that um, is going to propagate along the rod, along the solid. And so um, that's conduction of thermal energy. Con so, you know, this is mostly, this expression here is for solids. Now, what is the rate of energy transfer, energy transported per unit time, transfer per unit time, the heat energy per unit time, uh, in a fluid, like, you know, uh, liquids, gases. 
So in that case, the power, or the H, they call it, which is Q over delta T. There's a, actually, I don't think there is an expression for that in the textbook. I don't know if I wrote it down. I didn't even write it down. I think there's no expression like that in the textbook. But it's essentially something similar to this. Uh, you have an area, you have a temperature difference, and then you have a different parameter over here, which is a different parameter. Uh, but convection is the rate of energy transfer by the actual movement of a fluid that goes past something that is hot and then takes in the energy and delivers it to some place where it's cold. So it involves the bulk movement of a fluid, you know, liquids, uh, gases, they can flow. Um, and so let me just give you, uh, well, I, you know, we cited this example the other day. If you want to heat up the top layers of this water in this container, for example, and you start a fire over here at the bottom, so that'll heat up this water. Now you would think that the thermal energy will be conducted through the water, you know, from hot to cold, but that's not what happens. What happens is the water over here, when it gets heated, it expands. If it expands, the density becomes smaller than the rest of the water. And then that water, which is less dense than the rest of the water, rises. And it gets replaced by colder water, which then is heated, expands, density drops, rises, and so you have this convection current. So it's like, you know, you heat up the liquid over here, and then that liquid actually moves. There is a bulk movement of the liquid itself to the top layers, you know, and that's how you eventually heat up the entire body of water. It is not by conduction, it is rather by convection. Let me give you another example. Uh, the difference between this formula and this formula is that you don't have the L in the denominator. But you know this has a different. This is a different parameter than coefficient of, you know, uh, convection. Uh, coefficient of due to convection. But you know it's. I just want you to know what the process involves. But uh, there is really no formula that we use in this class for that. Um, so what if there is, let's say, a, um, I want to say, like a switch. And then over here, there is a resistor, you know, some electrical element. And then um, there is a fan over here. These are the blades of the fan, which is connected to this circuit over here, and you close the switch. And as you do that, when you close the switch, and there's a circuit in there with a resistor, and then what will happen is that there's gonna be, um, there's gonna be a current in the circuit, and the current is going to heat up this resistor, so the resistor will become hot. So now this is a hot resistor when it's on over here. And also, um, when you close the switch over here so that you have that current, then this fan is going to start zzz, you know, spinning. And what is that going to do? It's going to blow air. So let's say this is cool air, and it's going to blow this way. And now that air, which is a fluid, right? It's a gas. That air is going to move past this hot resistor, and thermal energy is going to be transfer from the hot resistor with, you know, to the cold air. And the air will then continue here, but now this is hot air because it picked up thermal energy from the hot resistor. And then you can sort of like uh, enclose this on something like this. And what you get out of here is hot air. And you may use that, I don't know, to you know, dry somebody's hair that may be wet. 
and you want to drive. You know. So essentially, what happens here is that this fluid, which is air, is moving, right? And it moves past a hot object. And the idea is to transfer thermal energy from the hot object to the colder object here. So the air comes in, picks up energy from the hot resistor, continues growing, and then delivers that energy. Now this is hot, this is cold, thermal energy is going to go into the hair, you know, to dry it. So how was, what was the mechanism by which thermal energy was delivered from the hot resistor to your hair? It was by the actual bulk movement of a fluid, air. So it's convection, it is not conduction. And that process is convection, not conduction. Okay, so excuse me for the lack of talent in drawing, but I hope you get the idea. All right, so now I wanna talk about the other mechanism of energy transfer, which is by radiation. And this is a topic that we are going to come back to later on when we say more about electromagnetic waves later on in the course. Just to be sure, we don't have an equation for conve or convection? No. Okay. Yeah, I don't think in the textbook they put one down. And the one that they put for conduction is uh, it's a simple case. You see, I did more on conduction in the extra examples. Okay, so, um, before I say something along those lines, let me, this is a topic that we're going to come back to later on in the course when we study chapter 32, I think it is. So I want to say something on what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. So let me write down what's called the electromagnetic spectrum. And I'm going to write a list of it here in a specific order. It is not random. It's a specific order. And I want you to be familiar with this list, the order in this list. So I'm going to write at the top radio, you know, radio waves, um, microwaves, infrared, and then visible, and then ultraviolet, and then X rays, and then gamma rays. Gamma, this is the Greek letter gamma rays. I mean, this is the Greek letter gamma. Gamma rays. Okay, so these are electromagnetic waves. They're all examples of electromagnetic waves. And um, when you talk about a wave, there are parameters that are used to describe a wave. Like, think of a wave, you can picture something like this, if you like. Um, you can talk about the maximum displacement from equilibrium, so that's called the amplitude. If this is a distance, then the distance, uh, by the way, this is called the trough. That's a trough, this is a trough. This is, this highest point over here is called the crest. That's the crest. So the trough is, it's this point, the trough is the lowest point. Now, the distance between adjacent troughs or adjacent crests, It's called the wavelength. And the symbol for that is the Greek letter for L, which is lambda. 
And then um, another parameter that's used to describe a wave is the frequency of the wave. It's the frequency of oscillation. Something is vibrating, and how frequently is that thing vibrating? How many cycles per second does it vibrate? You know, how many um, oscillations, os cycles um, does the thing make in one second? That's called the frequency. And if this wave travels to the right at speed v, this is the speed of propagation. of the wave, then the relationship between the speed of propagation and the frequency and the wavelength is, does anyone know? What speed? What's that? F lambda. What's that? So, you, you know, speed is a, is a, it's, it's a distance over time, right? So, during a time interval of one oscillation, one cycle, what's the name given to that time interval that it takes something to make one oscillation or one cycle? The time to make time in seconds or minutes or years or hours or days, how long, what is the name given to the time that it takes something to make one full cycle or one full oscillation? Yeah. Period. Now, what is the distance when the wave travels? What is the distance that the wave travels during one period of oscillation? That's the wavelength. In fact, this is how I like to define the wavelength. It's the distance that the wave is going to travel during a time interval that it takes whatever it is that's vibrating to make one oscillation. So therefore, this is wavelength over the period. But the period is the time per cycle. And the frequency is the number of cycles per unit time. It's the reciprocal. So one over the period is the frequency. So how fast the wave travels can simply be obtained by multiplying the wavelength of the wave by the period. I'm sorry, by the frequency. Or the wavelength divided by the period. Now, all of these waves over here in the electromagnetic spectrum, they all travel at the same speed in vacuum. They all travel at the same speed in vacuum. So, all, all of these, all these waves travel at the same speed in vacuum. And that speed is called C. And it's 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So all of these electromagnetic waves travel in vacuum at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. All of them. So, you know, a gamma ray travels in vacuum at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Microwaves travels in vacuum at 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Now, in the visible spectrum, we have many, well, colors that we can see. Um, we have, in a specific order, starting at the top, we have red, then orange. Then yellow, green, then there's blue, then there's a color that's between blue and purple, so indigo, and then violet. So the classification of these electromagnetic waves that come beyond the violet is the ultraviolet. And the classification of electromagnetic waves that come, you know, on the other end of the spectrum, you know, uh, it's the infrared. If you go down this list over here, 
the frequency of these waves increases. But wait a minute, if they all travel at the same speed and in vacuum, and this is lambda times f, what happens if the frequency increases? But what must also happen to the wavelength if the frequency increases? So the speed is the same. It has to decrease, right? So if you go down this list, the frequency increases or the wavelength d. So if I ask you which are the electromagnetic waves with the shortest wavelengths? Gamma rays. Which are the electromagnetic waves with the largest frequency? Largest frequency. Highest frequency. Gamma rays. Shortest wavelength, highest frequency. Which electromagnetic waves have the longest wavelength? Radio, radio, radio waves. waves. Which electromagnetic waves have the smallest or lowest frequency? Radio waves. Yeah, it's really the same question. Yes? Which of the visible colors of the spectrum which color has the longest wavelength? Red. Red. Which color has the shortest wavelength? Violet. Violet. Which of the colors in the visible spectrum corresponds to the highest frequency? Violet. Violet. Lower frequency? Red. So as you go down this list, for example, blue has a lower or shorter wavelength compared to green. And blue also has a higher frequency compared to green. So there's a specific order to this, okay? Now we'll talk more about electromagnetic waves later on, okay? Um, in the course. So what I, you know, what does this have to do with chapter 17. So in chapter 17, you encounter this. radio of this radiation emitted from the surface of the object in one second because power is energy over time so this is the energy emitted in one second I just to remind us is energy over time it is given by a constant called the Stefan Boltzmann constant which has a specific value times something called the emissivity of the surface of the object it has something to do with the surface of the object this area is the area of the surface of the object from where the object is emitting the energy. And this is the temperature, the absolute temperature on the surface of the object. And I said absolute temperature, so by that I mean in Kelvin. You cannot afford to plug in the number over here in Celsius because this is not a delta T raised to some power. This is the temperature raised to some power. So if you consider this cap, if you consider this object, right? That object is emitting electromagnetic waves. Uh, how much energy does it emit 
in one second? Well, a constant, 5.67 times 10 to the minus 11, sorry, times 10 to the minus 8. Actually, it's easy to remember this because it's 5, 6, 7, 8. 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 uh, times the emissivity, which I'll try to argue that for a block object, it's roughly 1. A is the area of the surface of the object from which the radiation is emitted. And T is the temperature in Kelvin on the surface of this object. So this table is emitting electromagnetic waves. This ruler is emitting electromagnetic waves. This whiteboard is emitting electromagnetic waves. This canvas screen is emitting electromagnetic waves. Me, I'm emitting electromagnetic waves. My ring is emitting electromagnetic waves. The cars outside are emitting electromagnetic waves. The trees outside are emitting electromagnetic waves. This building is emitting electromagnetic waves. The planet Earth is emitting electromagnetic waves. The sun is emitting electromagnetic waves. Every object emits electromagnetic waves by virtue of the temperature on the surface of the object. Now, if I take a detector of that radiation, suppose this is a detector, and I want to measure the energy emitted per unit time from Tyson. Meet Tyson. So um, this is my detector, so I go like this. And Tyson is emitting radiation in all directions. And I pick some of that up. I connect this to, a, to an interface to a computer. And I have the computer make a plot of the power emitted from the surface of Tyson, right, as a function of Weyman. And what I will discover is that the energy emitted per unit time, it looks something like this. Something like that. Very close to zero for very, very short wavelengths. Very close to zero energy emitted for very long wavelengths. The bulk is like over here. So this is one curve of one temperature on the surface of Tyson. So all of this is for one temperature. Notice also that Tyson isn't just emitting radiation of one wavelength. His body is emitting radiation over many wavelengths. And the nice thing is that if you figure out where the peak happens over here, you know, if you want to know what is the, if you figure this value of the wavelength when the energy emitted per unit time is a maximum, it turns out that I'm going to call this lambda max. So lambda max doesn't mean the maximum value of the wavelength that's emitted from the surface of the object because clearly this wavelength here is higher than that. This wavelength is higher than that. This wavelength is higher than that. Maybe the, the longest wavelength emitted will be like somewhere over there. So lambda max stands for the value of the wavelength at which he, out of all the wavelengths that he emits, right? It, that's when he emits the most amount of energy in one second. Yes? And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between this value of the wavelength where the peak occurs and the absolute temperature from the surface of where the object is emitting. And that relationship is this. If you multiply the value of that wavelength by the temperature in Kelvin on the surface of the object, it's a constant. It's 2.898 times 10 to the minus 3 when the wavelength is in meters and the temperature is in Kelvin. This is known as a Wien's displacement law. And the way you derive that expression or that relationship is 
there is an expression for the power emitted as a function of wavelength. And then all you do is, well, if you want to find the maximum of something, what do you do? You take the derivative of this with respect to lambda. That's the slope of the tangent line. At the highest point, the tangent line is horizontal. You set the slope equal to zero, and then you, know, you get that relationship. But you know, that's, I'm not going to go through that. At least not now. OK? So if I have an instrument that picks up the radiation emitted from the surface of an object, and I can figure out from the analysis of, the, of those data at what wavelength the object is emitting more energy than all the other wavelengths, then I can figure out the temperature on the surface of the object. So let's take a few cases. Let's consider um, let's consider well, I'm going to pick Tyson. How about we consider Tyson or this table or this board or the car outside or a tree outside. Let's consider you know, an object here on the surface of the Earth. I mean, we're roughly all at about the same temp surface uh, temperature, roughly. I mean, if I touch Tyson, the temperature on his skin is not going to be very different from the temperature of this table, the temperature of this, not going to be very different. So let's consider, you know, um, Number one, how about, you know, me, or Tyson, or you, or a tree outside or something? What would you say is the temperature of the surface of the object? Uh, roughly. Probably about 90 degrees. 90. Fahrenheit? Yeah. Isn't it 98 for people? 98 inside. In degrees Celsius, 37 degrees inside. The room? Room temperature is like 23 degrees Celsius. It's like 70. So the skin is like uh, you know in thermal contact with the room, but also with the inside. And how about we say 27? That's between room temperature and the temperature inside. And I want to say 27 because Celsius, because then what happens? How do you convert to Kelvin? Just add 270. Right. Yeah. Add 273, which is going to give you 300, which is easy, right? Not that it isn't, but you know, around 300 Kelvin. And this is true, not just me, but a tree, right? Car, building, you know, soccer ball, you know, stuff, right? So, what is the wavelength at which all of us, things around us, emit most of the energy. So let's figure it out. So lambda max would be what? 2.898 times 10 to the minus 3 meters Kelvin. And the temperature is 300 Kelvin, right? So this cancels that. So what do you get? And that will be in meters. Go ahead, work it out and tell me. Point six six times ten to the negative six. Nine point six six times ten to the negative six meters. Now, how about I convert meters to nanometers? Because I don't know this too much. So, um, one times ten to the nine. One nanometer is ten to the minus nine meters. So the units cancel. 
So how many nanometers will this be? 9.66 times 10 to the third. Which is 9,666. Yes? Now, what is the range of wavelengths roughly in the uh, visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum? Does anyone know roughly the range of electromagnetic Sub wavelengths? 400 to 700 nanometers. Right, so this is like up to like 700 nanometers. And this goes down to like 400 nanometers. So where would 10,000 nanometers lie? Microwave? In the electromagnetic spectrum. Mm -hmm. Where? Microwave or infrared? Mm -hmm. Infrared. In other words, you, me, that table, that chair, the tree outside, the cars outside, the mountains outside, this wall, emit in the infrared. Yes? Now, how do I know that Tyson is there, that he's present in class today, and not absent? Well, of course, you see him there. Well, I see you there, right? But if you emit in the infrared, and so do you, and so do you. And I see you with my eyes, which are detectors of visible radiation. I can only see radiation that ranges in wavelengths from about 700 to 400 nanometers, and you're emitting around 10,000. How come I'm able to see you? If you're emitting radiation in a range of wavelengths that my eyes cannot pick up. Because the light from the room is bouncing off of it. Because what? Exactly. In order for me to see Tyson, I don't see him by the radiation that he emits or that you emit. I see you guys by the visible light made in these lamps. Notice we are inside the room, right? And we have some sunlight coming in through the glass over there, right? So by the visible light that's made over here, and then that visible light goes boom and hits Tyson and you and me and bounces off Tyson to my eyes. So I see you, I see this table, I see this marker over here, not by the radiation that they emit, because they emit in the infrared, and my eyes are not detectors of infrared radiations, so neither are your eyes. But I see these objects by the visible light that they reflect. Reflection is not the same thing as emission. We make visible lights, right, and then boom, hits this object and reflect to my eyes, and then I see them by the light that they reflect. If we meet in this room tonight at two o'clock in the morning and we really sh shut the door and really block that glass and we turn off the lights, I'm not gonna be able to see you at all, even though you're all emitting infrared radiation. I mean, I will see the table. And if I try to walk in here, I'll bump into the table. It's emitting radiation, but my eyes are not detectors of infrared ra radiation. Yes? So at night, you know, because of advances in technology and so on, we can make visible light, you know, lamps, light bulbs, and so on, to illuminate our surroundings so that we don't bump into things at home. And at night, we turn on the headlights of our cars to illuminate the road so we don't go and crash into a tree, right? Sometimes if there's a full moon, which I think in the next few nights, well, maybe in another week or so, we might have a full moon, um, Light comes from the sun, hits the moon, reflects from the moon, which comes to the earth, and then, you know, when there's a full moon, you know, you don't really need that much help to see around, right? Because you have that visible light that the moon reflects, right? That originated in the sun. Now, during the days, I don't need to go outside and turn on my headlights. The sun is making visible radiation that comes to earth and illuminates the ground and the road for me, so I don't need to turn on the headlights. But at night when we are on the other side, you know, so that when, the, when we are on earth and that side of the earth is, you know, so that the sun is on the other side, 
then we need help. So we have lampposts, you know, and that sort of thing to make visible light so that we can see those objects. Yes? No? Now, suppose that I consider, so, you know, all of the objects, you know, on the surface of the earth, roughly, you know, they're not high enough to emit in the visible. Notice, what would have to happen to Tyson in order for him to emit radiation with a wavelength value here, lambda max, that would be in the region, of the, in, the, in the visible region of the spectrum? What would have to happen to his temperature? Get a lot bigger, right? Because this is for these objects at room temperature, right? Um, this is around 10,000 nanometers, which is in the infrared. We need to bring it down to like, so that it falls within this region so that we can see it. But if this guy is gonna go down in value, this has to go up. So we're not hot enough to emit in the visible. Now, suppose that, can I erase this? Can yes. I erase this? Suppose that I took my detector and I went outside and I aimed it at the sun. So, there's radiation coming in directly from the sun, right? So let me do as a second example, the sun. And when I do that for the sun, I get the radiation hitting my detector, send it to the computer, have it do a graph, and this turns out to be around 500 nanometers. Isn't that interesting? It's like here, right at the visible. And remember, this doesn't mean that the sun is only emitting you know, somewhere in the blue-green region of the spectrum, or blue region of the spectrum, right? You know, there are wavelengths higher, there are wavelengths shorter than that, right? So for the sun, lambda max, it's around 500 nanometers. So what we can do is, we can write that the temperature on the surface of the sun is you know, divided by 500 times 10 to the minus nine meters. So this cancels that. So what is the temperature on the surface of the sun? What do you get in Kelvin? Thousand seven hundred ninety-six. So fifty-eight hundred. How much would that be in degrees Celsius? Subtract two seventy-three. What do you get? About, like about fifty-five hundred. Around fifty-five hundred. And how do you convert that to Fahrenheit? So the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit is nine fifths C. Plus 32, I think. Try that and see what you get. It should be around 10,000 or something. Or minus 32, I, I don't. Uh oh. <laughs> I got 9,932. 9, but that's with the plus 32. Yeah, but the 32 don't really matter. It doesn't really matter, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's plus 32. It's plus 32? At least in my notes. I hope they're not wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, it's good. It's 
So, 10,000? Degrees Fahrenheit, right? That's how hot the sun is. Which, you know, it's hot enough that it emits in the vicinity. And it emits ultraviolet radiation as well and infrared, but you know, it emits a lot in that region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And because the sun is that hot on its surface, it makes visible light and it illuminates the part of the earth that the sunlight is hitting. And we can therefore see the objects during the day without turning on the lights outside. By the way, the sun, I, I should make this comment so you, you know, realize the limitations of this. Here's the sun, if this is the sun, right? That's the sun, right? So, the radius of the sun is about 700,000 kilometers, right? And the sun emits, emits, emits in all directions, right? And this temperature, remember that in this expression, this is the temperature on the surface of the object. So that temperature that we have of 10,000 degrees, that's on the surface. So the temperature of the surface of the sun, it's about 5,500 degrees Celsius. At the center of the sun, at the center of the sun, the temperature is like 15 million. Well, I'll just say 15 million degrees Celsius, which is like 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. Right, so, so note that this expression right, tells you um, what the temperature on the surface of the object is, not you know, what the temperature inside the object is. And there could be other processes going on in there. But, um, and by the way, this is how we, this is how you can um, measure or claim what the temperature on the surface of the sun is, right? If you read a newspaper article or magazine article or some paper or the textbook and it tells you the temperature on the surface of the sun is 5,800 Kelvin or so, uh, you may wonder, hmm, how, how, how do they know that? Did they send an astronaut to the moon with a thermometer? Uh, not to the moon, to the sun with a thermometer? Ah, it's 5,800 people and Kelvin and then come back? That's not how it's done, right? In fact, nowadays you get a, you know, you start feeling not so good, you go to the doctor, and then when they, you know, do the quick, you know, uh, checkup as you go in, the nurse might come in and go like, or they stick it in here, and then they read it. Right? So that is a detector of the radiation emitted from the from your skin, right? And so, especially here, so it, it detects the radiation. It does something like this. It quickly figures out the wavelength at which most of the energy is emitted, and then uses that formula, converts it to what we understand here in the U.S. You know, degrees Fahrenheit. And boom, within three seconds or so, you can tell what the temperature. So they try, to, they try to do it here, and it's got to be calibrated to know what it should be on the inside. So, but that's that's roughly how those thermometers work, right? Um, okay, we're good. Okay, uh, you know, uh, sometimes in astronomy you hear people talk about a a blue giant star. What do you mean blue? I mean, the light it gives off. It emits in the blue, and in the red, in the orange, in the microwave, in that, you know, most in the infrared, in the ultraviolet. It's just that this center wavelength here is like in the blue region of the spectrum. Right? That's, that's what that means. But it doesn't mean that, you know, the thing is blue, that it only emits blue. It's just the, the this lambda max falls in the region corresponding to the blue region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, 
What else? Okay. Um, 